In today's video, we're going to talk about protein requirements, both at an individual level and at a population level. Protein is unique among the three macronutrients because we have quite good objective measures to determine somebody's individual protein intake. In this video, we're going to describe what the dietary recommended intake for protein is and how it was established. We're going to talk about the fundamental basis for various different measurements of protein and amino acid requirements. We're then going to look at the population level variability in protein and amino acid requirements and compare that to the DRI and ask the question, is the DRI appropriate? Finally, we're going to talk about how activity affects protein requirements and what is the optimal level of protein intake when paired with resistance exercise. There's really three kinds of ways that you could determine protein requirements. First is you could look at somebody's normal intake and compare that to the dietary recommended intake. The second, especially for somebody who's an infant or a child, you can look at their growth rates. One mark of protein deficiency is reduced growth rates. The third way, which protein has a big advantage over carbohydrates and fat, is we can experimentally measure an individual's protein requirements using three different tools, nitrogen balance, direct amino acid oxidation, and indirect amino acid oxidation. Let's talk about nitrogen balance first. Nitrogen is an atom that is almost exclusively present in protein. It's present in small amounts in fat and sometimes in carbohydrates, but it's present in every single amino acid. Therefore, on balance, if we determine whether or not somebody's nitrogen intake matches their nitrogen excretion, we can determine whether their protein intake is sufficient. Let's go through some examples. If somebody ingests a known amount of nitrogen, and we measure exactly how much nitrogen they excrete through their urine and their feces, we can calculate the difference between how much they're ingesting and how much is being excreted. If those amounts are exactly the same, you intake a certain amount of nitrogen and you excrete the exact same amount of nitrogen, they're in nitrogen balance. If your nitrogen intake exceeds your nitrogen excretion, that means you're in positive nitrogen balance. That's associated with things like growth, pregnancy, and tissue repair. However, if your nitrogen intake is less than your nitrogen excretion, you're in negative nitrogen balance. That's one way that we can determine whether somebody's protein requirements are meeting their body's needs. The second way that we can do this is through direct amino acid oxidation. The principle here is that amino acids, if they are in excess, will be oxidized and converted into carbon dioxide. If you look at the molecule on the right, this is phenylalanine. You can see that the farthest right carbon is labeled with a stable carbon-13 isotope. If that amino acid is oxidized, that carbon-13 is released as 13-carbon labeled carbon dioxide. So if you provide somebody with that radio-labeled phenylalanine, you can measure how much carbon dioxide is produced. The amount of 13C carbon dioxide produced is indicative of how much of that amino acid is being oxidized, and therefore, broadly, how much protein is being oxidized. If there's high levels of carbon dioxide being produced, that amino acid or protein is in excess. And if there's low amounts of carbon dioxide production, that suggests that that amino acid is limiting. The third method is indicator amino acid oxidation. This works on the reverse principle. If one essential amino acid is missing, in general, all amino acids will be oxidized. The reason for that is to make a protein, you have to have all the amino acids in the body. So if one is limiting, generally all amino acids are broken down. To do this experimentally, you provide a stable isotope labeled essential amino acid, usually carbon-13 phenylalanine. Again, you're measuring the amount of carbon-13 that's produced. If you look at the graph on the right, what you can see is as the total protein intake increases, the amount of carbon dioxide that is from the 13C alanine decreases. This continues up until a steady state, at the point here marked as the breakpoint. At that stage, more protein intake doesn't reduce amino acid oxidation anymore that phenylalanine oxidation continues at a steady level. The breakpoint is set at where that individual's protein requirements are. So let's compare these three methods. Nitrogen balance has the advantage that it doesn't use any isotopes, but it requires very specific diets and careful collection of urine and feces over multiple days. It also requires a few days of adaptation where you get used to the diet that they're providing with you. Direct amino acid oxidation, much like indirect amino acid oxidation, has the advantage that you can test both total protein and individual amino acid requirements. Direct amino acid oxidation has much shorter of an adaptation period, but has the limitation that not all amino acids can be oxidized into labeled carbon dioxide. Also, if you're providing too much of the radio-labeled amino acid, that now affects the size of the amino acid pool, which could then affect the results. In the case of indirect amino acid oxidation, again, you can test both total protein and individual amino acid requirements, and there's very little adaptation period needed, maybe none. You can test both conditionally essential amino acids and essential amino acids, 
as well as dispensable amino acids. The limitations are it uses a radioisotope, and it is unclear right now which indicator amino acid is always ideal. However, indirect amino acid oxidation is considered the gold standard for determining protein requirements. Let's return to the DRI for protein. Shown on the right is the acceptable macronutrient distribution range for protein, and the RDA for protein is set at 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. This was set by the Institute of Medicine in 2005. So if we return to the previous study where we looked at the breakpoint across multiple people, let's compare that result to what they used when they set the RDA at the Institute of Medicine. Recall, the RDA is the EAR plus two standard deviations. So when the Institute of Medicine was setting the RDA, they measured the EAR across people to be 0.68 grams per kilogram per day, usually by nitrogen balance. The standard deviation of these measurements was pretty low, 0.1 grams per kilogram per day. So therefore, they estimated the RDA to be 0.88 grams per kilogram per day, and they rounded that down to 0.8. Remember, the RDA is the amount of protein that's required for 97.5% of people. However, if we look at the previous study we just evaluated with the breakpoint, they estimate the EAR to be 0.93 grams per kilogram per day. This is using indirect amino acid oxidation. They also sound substantially more variability in individuals' protein requirements, 0.44 grams per kilogram per day. You can see that the RDA would be much higher, 1.8 grams per kilogram per day, more than double what the current RDA is. But this hasn't been adopted. Take a minute and think. What would be some downsides of dramatically increasing the RDA for protein? One other aspect of protein is that the amount of protein a person needs actually is quite dependent on their activity levels. So let's go through one example involving resistance training. It's been quite strongly established that protein intake works alongside resistance training to promote muscle growth. What you're seeing here in the graph on the right is a meta-analysis, each dot a specific study where they measured change in fat-free mass, or muscle growth, and total protein intake during the resistance training intervention. What you can see if you look at the left-hand side of the graph is as protein intake increases up to about 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, there's a benefit for muscle mass accretion. However, beyond 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, there's no additional benefit. In summary, protein is an essential nutrient that's required for growth and health. There's several different ways we can measure protein requirements, and these can be measured experimentally. This means that protein requirements can be determined much more rigorously than fat or carbohydrate requirements, and they can be measured at an individual level. Studies using indirect amino acid oxidation overestimate the amount of protein that is required compared to nitrogen balance. And it's controversial right now whether the DRA for protein is correct or it's too low. Part of this is because as people have used indirect amino acid oxidation, they've found that there's higher than expected inter-individual variance in protein requirements. This is an important part of determining dietary recommended intake. Another part of dietary protein intake is protein requirements are quite sensitive to activity levels. As somebody has higher exercise activity levels, their protein requirements are gonna increase and their demand is gonna be much higher. Unlike carbohydrates and fat, we can experimentally determine an individual's protein requirements. We can measure it at different time points, across different stages, and across different activity levels. Because of this, there's quite a lot of rigor in determining what an individual's protein requirements are, and that can be used to determine what is the precise amount of protein that is optimal for a person based on their lifestyle, activity levels, and where they are in their age, sex, and pregnancy spectrum.